original plan for Charles soon became undone. In February 1639, the Covenanters struck first by taking the castled town of Inverness, securing the munitions stored there. A few days later, Huntley responded by moving his horsemen on a Covenanters meeting at Turriff, but withdrew when it was clear that his outnumbered opponents were up for a fight. The Covenanters Alexander Leslie and James Graham, the 5th Earl of Montrose, combined their northeastern forces and captured Aberdeen. They entered Aberdeen in March unopposed and captured Huntley in the process. The same month, Covenanter forces captured the castles at Dunglass and Tantallon, but it was the capture a few days later of Edinburgh Castle that caused serious disruption to Charles's plan. Hamilton's amphibious force would now have to divert to the Firth of Forth. Hamilton anchored off Leith on the 1st of May. He waited for the King's army to approach from the south before disembarking. Charles arrived at York on the 30th of March and was disappointed both in the size and the quality of the troops. Charles also received news that Antrim's force of 10,000 was destined never to leave Ireland due to clan politics. Charles ordered Thomas Wentworth to replace Antrim and come over with a force from the Irish army. Wentworth, however, was not ready to mobilize and pleaded with the king to wait. But Charles arrived on the 30th of May with his army at Berks, three miles west of Berwick. It was the first army he had ever commanded in the field. Leslie had begun concentrating forces protecting the Scottish borders as early as April. The Covenanters were ordered not to advance closer than 10 miles of the border, but on the 25th of April, some of the English troops entered Scotland and read out the King's proclamation at Duns. The Covenanters promptly moved forces further south. One such group was stationed in Kelso, and on the 3rd of June, Charles sent just over 3,000 men to drive them out. The English force quickly found themselves outnumbered and in danger of being cut off, so retreated back to Berks. Leslie then moved nearly 20,000 men to Duns on the 5th of June. In a major intelligence blunder by the English, the Covenanter army were able to move within striking distance unnoticed and unreported by the English. The Covenanters could actually see the King's Pavilion before Charles was aware they were there. Have not I good intelligence, lamented the king, that the rebels can march with their army and encamp within sight of mine, and I not have a word of it till the body of their army give the alarm? This resulted in a humiliating retreat, witnessed and mocked by the entire Scottish army. Charles lost his nerve and wasted little time in agreeing to a treaty negotiated by the Scots. He and the Covenanter nobles signed the Treaty of Berwick on the 18th of June. The two armies disbanded, work was halted on all fortifications, all castles belonging to the king would be restored, and all royalist prisoners freed. In July, agreements between the king and the Covenanters did not progress. In the end, Charles decided not to attend the assembly in Edinburgh, but decided to send a representative. By November, Charles pushed to have the Scottish Parliament discontinued for six months, until June 1640. Despite his earlier military rebuke, he was determined to bring the matter to a close by force. Turning once again to his Lord Deputy in Ireland, Thomas Wentworth was summoned back to England while still holding the reins in Ireland to become the King's closest advisor in matters of war. In January, he was created the Earl of Strafford. Strafford embraced his new appointment and did everything he could to squeeze funds from Parliament in order to raise the war effort. Under the King's authority, Strafford left for Ireland to raise an army of 8,000 foot and 1,000 horse in March 1640. With debts incurred from the First Bishop's War and with the payment of ship money practically ceased, Charles begrudgingly recalled Parliament for the first time in 11 years. They met on 13th of April, 1640, and agreed to vote huge sums for the war effort. But first, their own grievances were to be addressed. Despite his desperation for funds, Charles could not meld with Parliament's approach to government. After just three weeks, he dissolved the short Parliament. Charles attempted to secure funds from Spain, 
and after that failed, agreed to allow his queen to approach the Vatican's emissary on the possibility of a loan from the Pope. To worsen matters, wholesale desertion began among the newly levied troops. The militiamen became disorderly and in some cases whole units mutinied and even murdered their Catholic officers. Percy Algernon, Earl of Northumberland, had been appointed Commander-in-Chief of the English Army. Plans were discussed to raise an army of 35,000 foot and 3,000 horse. Offers were made to mercenaries abroad for leadership positions. However, all these schemes relied on more than Strafford's enthusiasm. While Charles continued funding his plans, the militia army was ordered to concentrate in central Yorkshire. Under command of Lord Conway, a large force of about 12,000 was deployed to Newcastle and Berwick. Conway spent his little resources fortifying Berwick with none to spare at Newcastle. The Covenanters prepared for war. In May, Monroe occupied Aberdeen, and in June, Argyll mustered a force of about 5,000 to clear Royalist sympathizers in central Scotland. Units began besieging Edinburgh Castle and under Leslie gathered a vast army of about 20,000 foot, 2,000 horse, and over 60 pieces of artillery. Aware of the inadequacies of the English army to the south, Leslie broke the agreement and on the 20th of August he masked the fort at Berwick and sent Lord Montrose over the River Tweed at Coldstream, while Lord Almond crossed at Kelso. The same day, concerned by Conway's reports, Charles left London and headed north. Strafford did not follow him for some days as he was ill in London at the time. To prevent the Royal Navy impeding their march, Leslie's army used two inland routes directly towards Newcastle. The Berwick garrison failed to launch any effectual sorties against Leslie's left flank during the seven-day march to the Tyne. Leslie's aim was to cross the Tyne at the fords at Newburn, about four miles upstream from Newcastle. Conway decided to block their advance using the River Tyne as the barrier. On 24th August, Conway deployed west to the fords at Newburn with 3,000 foot, 2,000 horse, and eight guns. He left the majority of his force, about 7,500 men, to guard the unprepared but important city of Newcastle, the source of London's coal. On the south bank of the Tyne, he reinforced the two sconces and waited for the arrival of his English reinforcements, hoping they would outpace the pursuing Scots. The English army was making slow progress from York and Charles was a couple of days behind with the rear guard. Early on 28th of August, the first of Leslie's troops arrived on the heights above the two fords. Montrose pushed the cavalry out to the flanks and Alexander Hamilton established a number of guns on the higher ground by a church. Leslie battered Conway's entrenchments till his raw infantry left their guns and ran and the Scottish horse and foot crossed the ford with little resistance from the English cavalry. In the afternoon, the first wave of dragoons and infantry waded the fords, supported by heavy artillery fire from the north bank. It drove away the Royalist cavalry and quickly overwhelmed the two small sconces. Harry Wilmot, commanding a cavalry detachment, charged the Scots as they tried to establish a bridgehead on the south bank. The Scots held and their numbers increased. The balance of English cavalry then fled, trampling down their infantry in the process. Had it not been for the quick thinking of Lieutenant Colonel George Monk, directing the artillery guns to deter the now overwhelming Scots, the English losses would have been greater. By early evening, about half the Covenanter force was across the Tyne and on the south bank. Conway pulled back in haste and after a consultation with Sir Jacob Astley decided to abandon Newcastle moving south with all speed. 
The next day, the Covenanter army moved east toward Newcastle along the two opposite banks. On 30th of August, Wesley entered the city. It was ungarrisoned but stocked with provisions. The Covenanters were astonished and resupplied their forces. Wesley called his reserves from Edinburgh. Charles fell back to York and was joined by Strafford on the 4th of September. A few hours after meeting with Strafford, Charles received Wesley's messenger. The Scottish demands arrived. Charles played for time and agreed to a ceasefire. However, a few weeks later, the king was delivered a blow. The Great Council of Peerage met at York and urged Charles to agree to another truce with Scotland and advise the recall of the Westminster Parliament. In other words, England was not behind him. On the 2nd of October, the Covenanters insisted immediately that the talks were only to discuss a cessation of hostilities. Negotiating any lasting treaty would only be with the English Parliament. To make matters worse, the Scots demanded that the English pay £850 a day to quarter the Scottish troops until the treaty was concluded. Charles was cornered. His council of peers advised him to accept the terms and recall Parliament. Charles begrudgingly agreed, but at the same time asked Strafford to make haste in mobilizing his Irish army.